Hello, this is the A Course in Miracles Palm Beach Study Group. Today is April 29th, uh, 2021. Now we will start with a moment of silence. Thank you, Fred. We are starting chapter three tonight, The Innocent Perception. And section one, Atonement Without Sacrifice, uh, paragraph one. A future, a further point must be perfectly clear before any residual fear still associated with miracles can disappear. The crucifixion did not establish the atonement. The resurrection did. Many sincere Christians have misunderstood this. No one who is free of the belief in scarcity could possibly make this mistake. If the crucifixion is seen from an upside down point of view, it does appear as if God permitted and even encouraged one of his sons to suffer because he was good. This particular unfortunate interpretation which arose out of projection, has led many people to be bitterly afraid of God. Such anti-religious concepts enter into many religions. Yet the real Christian should pause and ask, how could this be? It is, is it likely that God himself would be capable of the kind of thinking which his own words have clearly stated is unworthy of his son? If any of you have um, questions or reactions, so please unmute yourselves. All righty then, we'll go to paragraph two. The best defense, as always, is not to attack another's position, but rather to protect the truth. It is unwise to accept any concept if you have to invent a whole frame of reference in order to justify it. This procedure is painful in its minor applications and generally tragic on a wider scale. Persecution frequently results in an attempt to justify the terrible misperception that God himself persecuted his own son on behalf of salvation. The very words are meaningless. It has been particularly difficult to overcome this because although the error itself is no harder to correct than any other, many have been unwilling to give it up in view of its prominent value as a defense. In milder forms, a parent says, this hurts me more than it hurts you and feels exonerated in beating a child. Can you believe our father really thinks this way? It is so essential that all such thinking be dispelled, that we must be sure that nothing of this kind remains in your mind. I was not punished because you were bad. The holy benign lesson the atonement teaches is lost if it is tainted with this kind of distortion 
in any form. Any questions, comments? I have a comment. Yes, Jeffrey. Uh, it's very easy for me to agree with this and the former paragraph. Um, I don't have an issue with that. I do. The only thing I, I personally do is accept other people's, like the paragraphs have said, that are different than my philosophy. Uh, because there's no sense in arguing with someone who grows up and uh, is not enlightened. And uh, if they're stuck, you can't be angry with them. That doesn't do anything. Right. So I just um, listen for a while, and if it goes on too long, then I look at my watch, and <laughs> I, I I make a polite excuse to depart. But um, it's barely helpful for me to be among other people that are like minded. Right. It's it's just, and I have been on my own for a while now. And thank you, John, for giving me the passcode and all the um, assistance to get with the group again. I'm really grateful. That's all I have to say at the moment. Okay, thank you. So, yes, what Stephanie just said, that the fat first sentence, the best defense, as always, is not to attack another's position, but rather mm -hmm. to protect the truth. So I like I like that. I like that to protect the truth. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one other thing I want to point out here, though, is uh, that one sentence where he says, um, uh, well, let me find it again. I was not punished because you were bad. So obviously here, this is, you know, this is Jesus talking. Uh, he is the author of the course. And so whenever it says I, that's uh, he's speaking. So he's referring to himself. I was not punished because you were bad. So we'll go on now to paragraph three. The statement, quote, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, unquote, is a misperception by which one assigns his own evil past to God. The evil past has nothing to do with God. He did not create it, and he does not maintain it. God does not believe in retribution. His mind does not create that way. He does not hold your evil deed against you. It is likely that he would hold them. Is, oh, is it likely that he would hold them against me? Be very sure that you recognize how utterly impossible this assumption is and how entirely it arises from projection. This kind of error is responsible for a host of related errors, including the belief that God rejected Adam and forced him out of the Garden of Eden. It is also why you may believe from time to time that I am misdirecting you. I have made every effort to use words that are almost impossible to distort but it is always possible to twist symbols around if you wish. So let me go over this a bit because he talks about perception and misperceptions. Uh, the misperception, what he's saying is that's, that's ego talking. It's ego that, that misperceives. So any misperception, any misperception that there is is ego thinking, okay? So it's a misperception to assign evil to God. 
you know, he says God has nothing to do with it. His mind does not create that way. God creates with love, not with hate. So, um, and he's cautioning us to be sure we recognize how utterly impossible this, this assumption is that, that people have held and religions have perpetrated uh, through the centuries. And that's you know, why he's here to, um, to give us new insights into the spiritual reality to reteach us and to help us unlearn all the misperceptions of ego thinking. That's what this whole course is all about, is changing your mind from ego mind to spirit mind. The same thing about, you know, he gives another example, God rejected Adam and forced him out of the garden of evil. That's, that's ego talk. That's, 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 God would not do that, that's ridiculous. Adam took himself out of the garden by ego thinking. <laughs> Okay, when they say the devil made me do it, change that around. The ego made me do it. <laughs> that's, how you're just, that's, that's the truth of the matter. So, and then he says, I, Jesus, have made every effort to use words that are almost impossible to distort, to distort but it is always possible to twist symbols around if you wish. Ego will always find a way. And there are people who have, you know, condemned the course, who have misunderstood the course, who uh, have, have um, misperceived, you know, what the course was saying and misinterpreted the course because there's always a way for ego to twist symbols around. Any comments? Questions? Ed? We have to unmute Ed. Uh, I have a question. Where does this statement, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord? Where does that come from? I believe it's in the Old Testament. Okay. It's probably in one of the Psalms or something. I, I'm not a, a biblical scholar, so I, I can't pinpoint it. But if you Google vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'm sure it will give you exactly where it is said in the Old Testament. Well, I've heard it over the years and I didn't right. know where it came from. Romans 12, 19. Oh, my goodness, Helena, you're right on the dot. <laughs> so that's Romans, then that's the New Testament. That's the epistle. That's Paul. So are we taking it out of context or where, where, how does this, how did this arise and, and How did it get in the Bible? What is it? What was it supposed to to signify? Well, it's out of it context. Doesn't look good. <laughs> it doesn't look good. What I'm seeing seems to suggest that it's God has wrath. Yeah. Yeah. The the wrathful God is all through the Old Testament. That's why I thought it was there. But Paul, you know, Paul was was speaking from evil, from ego. He thought he was speaking spirit. And I mean, there are things that he said that, that where he was speaking spirit, but there's other, but he had a mixed mind. So some of the things he taught were, were ego and, and others were spirit. And this is one of the ego things that he must have said, because if it's in Romans, that's, a, that's one of Paul's epistles. Well, isn't the Bible su supposed to, to one of one of the one of the things that the Bible is supposed to to uh, represent is is the truth and 
teaching, in other words, generation to generation is to learn from the Bible and here yet there is this vengeance thing and it's, should it still be there? Are we? Well, yeah. men wrote the Bible. Okay. There's people who believe that it's the word of God. And there, there are many things that you can find throughout the Old and the New Testament that, that do teach on a spiritual level. But it's all mixed up because there's a lot of it that is just ego level thinking because, you know, people wrote it. And, and I mean, one of the misperceptions is that there's sacred texts and that it's the word of God and you take everything literally. If you took everything that's in the Bible literally, I don't think you could survive because it says one thing in one place and says the opposite thing in another place and what have you and what have you. So, you know, and that's why um, in many places throughout the course, um, uh, Jesus is trying to clarify certain understandings in the Bible. Like he did at the very beginning of this chapter when he said that, you know, that there's a lot of Christians who believe that, that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. And he's saying, oh, no, that's all phony baloney. That's all ego thinking. That's not what happened. I think he, I think he um, explains later on that he voluntarily choose to do that because it was a public demonstration because he knew that after the fact he would resurrect and walk amongst the disciples to prove to them that there was no death that, and that's 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 the, the story for for real, you know. He came and said, "Oh look, they killed me. Oh, but I'm still here. <laughs> ah, hello, surprise." <laughs> well, it seems like when you're going through the evangelical uh, experience in your life that this was. Uh, this was supposed to be that kind of thing that, uh, that, well, I looked at it as if he were, he were crucified because he was a threat to the government and that um, the resurrection happened, but it was the kind of thing that only happened to him and a couple others. And, you know, you don't get, if you're, if you're foc focusing on the, on the Bible as an authority for Christianity, you, you, uh, you can be, um, a bit confused by these things. Yes, you can. And the ego will continue to confuse you as much as you possibly can, or if you possibly can. Yes, Helene. I'm thinking in a way, though, it really does have to do with how you interpret these messages or these lessons, right? I mean, I, I look at the language that is quoted in Romans, and it seems to be suggesting that humans shouldn't worry about vengeance or retribution god will take care of it so in other words you know don't you be vengeful well in a way isn't that karma right i mean don't we say in other religions that you don't have to worry about someone's payback that's karma they'll get theirs in time right so 
but but I do understand that certain religions teach this very differently. Even last night, John, I recognized in the message that you gave in the Interfaith Network's meditation, they were talking about guilt and not feeling guilty because anything that you've done wrong can be undone. There are ways to correct those errors. And in, I was raised a Catholic, as you were. In, in the teachings I received, you had to feel guilty for even thinking something that was not in alignment with the purest of pure. So it didn't matter that your evil deeds could be corrected, just the thought that you had that some that was impure was a reason for you to feel guilty. So I, I, it's difficult raised in the Catholic faith and understanding the Bible the way it was taught to me to embrace these concepts, but I have to admit, I love them. <laughs> They're so much easier and, and loving and caring as opposed to, you know, deep, dark, dank, evil, guilty badness that, you know, seem to permeate every day of my eight years of elementary school at St. Michael's. Yes. I understand completely. I had the same experience. God's gonna get you for that. God's oh gonna get you yeah. <laughs> stop, stop. I still feel guilty. <laughs> so to, to to reply to your comment, uh, uh, Helene, is that um, you know I if you if you just read and Paul, and you were saying, okay, he was explaining that you don't have to take vengeance because, you know, God will take care of it. And, and that's fine and good, and you can get a positive lesson out of that. But AC, ACIM would say, you don't have to take vengeance because that person's ego will bring his bad karma back to him and not place that on God. The father only loves, the, fa the father could never take vengeance on any of us. So for Paul, on the one hand, to say you shouldn't do vengeance, that belongs to God. Well, the not doing vengeance is right, but the that belongs to God is not right. That belongs to ego. Ego is going to cause the, the, the vengeance. And, but that's not what Paul's saying. And that's what um, the Course here is trying to. Uh, explain that, that that vengeance is mine saying the Lord is a misperception. The evil past has nothing to do with God, it says. He did not create it and he does not maintain it. That's strictly ego that does that. So does that help clarify it? Okay. Well, let's go on to where are we? Paragraph four. Sacrifice is a notion totally unknown to God. It arises solely from fear, and frightened people can be vicious. Sacrificing in any way is a violation of my injunction that you should be merciful, even as your Father in heaven is merciful. It has been hard for many Christians to realize that this applies to themselves. Good teachers never terrorize their students. To terrorize is to attack, and this results in rejection of what the teacher offers. The result is learning failure. 
And those of us who went through Catholic grade school know exactly what this is saying. <laughs> yes. So, so the lesson here is that we need to be merciful even as our Father in heaven is merciful. So that, you know, that, in, that in, uh, involves the very basic principle of ACIM, which is forgiveness. And it, you know, you can't be merciful unless there's forgiveness attached to it, you know? And it says it's been hard for many Christians to realize that this applies to themselves. <laughs> Really? I'm supposed to be merciful? <laughs> I'm supposed to forgive? You know, Trump has used fear uh, to uh, rally his supporters. Uh, yeah, he's but, like a million dollars to this guy with, whose first name begins with S-C-H something or other to do a psychological study to find out what is the most prevalent thing that they could utilize. Yes, yeah. they're utilizing fear. Yeah. yeah, not just him, but but uh, politicians throughout the centuries have, have done that. So, you know, go back to the Roman Empire and everything else. I and mean, that's, that's nothing new. We can lay that at the feet of many leaders throughout history. So, but these are the ones we have to live with. <laughs> well... The thing about, <laughs> you know, the, the thing about that is, is that, is that the, the, we, again, we always have choice of how we're going to think and react to whatever is happening to us. And we can either react with ego mind or we can ask, act, react with spirit mind. So, Ego mind gets all upset and fearful and uh, angry and, and what have you with with uh, people, but but spirit mind says, you know, like Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the meaning behind that is that anybody who really knew from a spiritual point of view, what they were doing would not do that because spirit would not do that. Only people operating from ego would behave that way. And those of us who are trying to live a spiritual life need to look at those situations and forgive because that's what spirit does and realize that they know not what they do. They're ignorant of their own spiritual selves. But they vote. <laughs> so are there any comments on, on this um, paragraph four? All righty, then we'll go to paragraph five. I have been correctly referred to as, quote, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. But those who represent the Lamb as bloodstained do not understand the meaning of the symbol. Of the symbol. Correctly understood, it is a very simple symbol that speaks of my innocence. The lion and the lamb lying down together symbolize that strength and innocence are not in conflict, but naturally live in peace. Quote, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, is another way of saying the same thing. A pure mind knows the truth, and this is its strength. It does not confuse destruction with innocence because it associates innocence with strength 
not with weakness. So again, the, the course is, is telling us that a lot of these things that we thought, that it's actually just the reverse from the spirit's point of view. And by the way, that symbol of the lion and the lamb lying down together, that's a symbol of Quakerism. Um, any questions there? Okay, paragraph six. Innocence is incapable of sacrificing anything because the innocent mind has everything and strives only to protect its wholeness. It cannot project. It can only honor other minds because honor is the natural greeting of the truly loved to others who are like them. The lamb taketh away the sins of the world in the sense that the state of innocence or grace is one in which the meaning of the atonement is perfectly apparent. The atonement is entirely unambiguous. It is perfectly clear because it exists in light. Only the attempts to shroud it in darkness have made it inaccessible to those who do not choose to see. Questions? Let me go over a couple of things here. Innocence of spirit, sacrificing of ego. Innocence is incapable of sacrificing anything. The innocent mind only strives to protect its own wholeness. Wholeness is spirit. Division is ego. It cannot project, only the ego projects. It can only honor, because honor is the natural greeting of the truly love to others who are like them. And from spirit's point of view, everybody is like them. The spirit says there's that of God in everybody. We're all spiritual beings. So the lamb taketh away the sins of the world. In other words, the spirit can, can correct all of the misperceptions of the ego. Is it taking away the sins is meaning that it can give you the understanding that the sin was all ego thinking. And once you get yourself out of that mindset and into the spiritual mind, then the sins are taken away because you're not thinking with the ego anymore. It's like the light coming out of the darkness. The room is dark, you walk into the dark room, but then you flip the switch and the light comes and whoa, all of a sudden, all the darkness is gone. There is no dark. Darkness only exists where there is not light. And the sin only exists where there is not spirit. So the lamb taketh away the sins of the world in the sense that the state of innocence or grace is one in which the meaning of the atonement is perfectly apparent. Those who are in the spiritual mind of innocence and grace understand the atonement and they realize that they're within that. So the sin has disappeared. The atonement's utterly unambiguous. It's not, there's no question mark here. It's perfectly clear because it exists in light. Only attempts to shroud it in darkness have made it inaccessible to those who choose 
who, to those who do not choose to see, those who decide with their ego mind and decide not to see in the spiritual side. Any questions, comments? Well, let's, let's move right along. We're up to chapter seven. You have something, Stephanie? Um, <clears throat> uh, something that you said stuck in my mind tonight, and that, that is um, that everyone is spirit. Everyone, every, and, and the other thing that you haven't mentioned, at least tonight, is we are, we are only one. <clears throat> that took a while for me to, to understand and accept. But um, if, if I'm just thinking of my own process right now, and it took a long time for me to um, separate what I learned as a, as a Catholic and a Jew, because I was raised by both. And uh, and to come to the acceptance of everything that the book has has said tonight, and um, I guess I'm wondering how I'm I'm a little bit curious. I'm I'm very curious actually about how that process begins and flourishes. You know, if I if I'm able to do it at seventy eight, it's it's it and it is a process. And the thing is, um, when one has other religions that they grew up with, that's very strong, and to be patient with yourself, because you come to this meeting. I've come to this meeting for a reason. What is the purpose of learning this? Is it for myself? What is it for? And I know you've talked about that at other meetings that I've attended, you know, face to face. That's all I really want to say. Thank you. And, and yes, it, it is a process and we are learning step by step, day by day. And hopefully, you know, it's, it's one thing to understand it intellectually, but the real key is putting it into practice. The real key is being able to forgive when, when the situation arises and to look at the other person and acknowledge the spirit within them. That's how the Quakers say there's that of God in everyone. Quakerism and of course of miracles are very close to that. And, and the oneness, as you mentioned, is also uh, you know, a, a part of this study is the understanding that we, we are all one. And the Course teaches that whatever you do for your brother, you do for yourself. And whatever you do for yourself, you do for your brother. It, it has to be that way because there's only one of us. And if David were here tonight, he would have said that 20 times already. <laughs> Hello, David. Hope you're here next week. So, paragraph eight. The innocence of God is the true state of the mind of his son. Now, remember, you are his son, even if you're a girl, according to the, the book. We only use the one because they don't want to get into duality. The innocence of God is the true state of mind of you. 
in this state, your mind knows God, for God is not symbolic. He is fact. Knowing his son as he is, you realize that the atonement, not sacrifice, is the only appropriate gift for God's altar, where nothing except perfection belongs. The understanding of the innocent is truth. This is why their altars are truly radiant. Any questions? John, did we go over paragraph seven as well? I might have missed it. Well, you know what? Um, I think you're right. I guess I kind of skipped it. So we'll go back. Thank you for bringing that up. In this instance, wisdom because of Paragraph seven. The atonement itself radiates nothing but truth. It therefore epitomizes harmlessness and sheds only blessings. It could not do this if it, if it arose from anything uh, but perfect innocence. Innocence is wisdom because it is unaware of evil and evil does not exist. It is, however, perfectly aware of everything that is true. The resurrection demonstrated that nothing can destroy truth. Good can withstand any form of evil as light abolishes forms of darkness. The atonement is therefore the perfect lesson. It is the final demonstration that all the other lessons I taught are true. If you can accept this one generalization now, there will be no need to learn from many smaller lessons. You are released from all errors if you believe this. Well, that was a very important paragraph to have skipped over. <laughs> wow. Any comments? Innocence is wisdom because it is unaware of evil. That's the same as saying that spirit is unaware of ego. And ego, evil does not exist. Ego is the illusion. In, in reality, in spiritual reality, it does not exist. It's just an illusion. But spirit is aware of everything that is true. And, and again, it says the resurrection demonstrates that nothing can destroy truth. Life is truth. Eternal life is truth. And the resurrection uh, of Jesus came to example that truth of eternal life. And we may only have that one example in our written history, but and that's why some people don't believe it. It's not like we can look and say, oh, look, there's been 20 people in the past year who resurrected from the dead. But he, you know, that, that, that was an example. That was a, a proof to them. Uh, uh, not, not, that, not that you could 
resurrect from the dead, but that there was no death. That's the important lesson here. Only, only the ego body dies. The spiritual being who we are inhabiting this body cannot die. It is eternal. As spirit is eternal. And that's the lesson to learn. Not that you can just die and then come back in a, in a, in a, in a body. Although reincarnation, that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> You are coming back in another body. So in a way, all of us have resurrected many, 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 many times. <laughs> but just in different bodies. But the real lesson here is that we are eternal spiritual beings. The resurrection demonstrated that nothing can destroy truth. Good can withstand any form of evil. Spirit can, re, uh, uh, can withstand any form of ego. As light abolishes darkness is the example I gave before. John? Yes. Can we get, get a comprehensive de definition of atonement? I'm getting a little of this, a little of that from each of these paragraphs. What exactly is the atonement in terms of something that you can- I'm putting it to you this way. The atonement is reaching enlightenment. The atonement is when you have been able to purge all of the ego mind from your mind. The atonement is when you're a complete spiritual realized being as Jesus was, Buddha. There are other people that were in history that, that we acknowledge as uh, having uh, reached enlightenment and broken the cycle of reincarnation. So they fulfilled the atonement because they realized themselves as pure, spiritual beings and were able to rid themselves of all guilt, rid themselves of all ego and live totally from spirit. So that's the atonement. And the thing is, is that that's the promise that we all have. The, the Course teaches that everyone will reach the atonement in time. Wow. In time, the universe will disappear because everyone would have released themselves from ego. Ego is the illusion. Ego created the universe and then the universe will disappear. And if you've ever read Gary Renard, that's the name of his first book, The Disappearance of the Universe. That's the book that got me reinterested in the A Course in Miracles and greatly helped me to understand the Course in Miracles was um, the Disappearance of the Universe by Gary Renard. How do you spell Renard? R-E-N-A-R-D, I believe. No Y in there. Okay. Thanks, John. Yeah. That was very good. I appreciate that. Yeah. So just to cover, did you want to speak, Stephanie? Just, just a, a brief thing that I learned in Judaism. Uh, for me, it was it was at meant. Oh, wait a minute! Did I mess up? Wait a at second. one minute. At one minute. So one. When I mentioned one before, we are just one. That does fall into place yeah. for me. Yeah. So and also what. Um, 
you know, I have a good friend that, that uh, was very interested in, in the course, and, and she got that book. And, you know, I haven't, and I'm going to get it. <laughs> okay, that's all I want to say. Okay. You know, because, you know Gary Renard, and he used to show uh, videos w- w- of him. So, anyway, bye. <laughs> okay. All right. At one, that's, that's good. At one was good. Yeah. Right. So, I'm just going to read uh, paragraph eight again as we had skipped over seven. The innocence of God is the true state of the mind of his son. In this state, your mind knows God. For God is not symbolic. He is fact with a capital F. Knowing his son as he is, you realize that the atonement, not sacrifice, is the only appropriate gift for God's altar, where nothing except perfection belongs. The understanding of the innocent is truth. That is why their altars are truly radiant. So we've got a little metaphor here at the end of calling, um, you know, God's altar and uh, the altars being radiant, what have you. So um, the the book does um, use a lot of metaphor throughout, and um, uh, and and one has to realize that you know it's it's not all completely literal. There's a lot of figurative language in the course, but it's made to give an image. Uh, at times, it's easier for us to understand if, if, uh, if it comes as, as a symbol, as an image, as an, um, a visual. Anyone? Because we're almost at the hour, and the thing about it is that um, we're at the end of this section. So I think we'll just mark uh, miracles as true perception, and we'll, we'll begin there next week instead of starting it and only getting through one paragraph of it. And we've already lost one person who had to leave, so. John, my extrasensory perception is telling me that Eileen wants to say something. Oh, Eileen, did you raise your hand? I didn't see. I, I, I know, Eileen, you caught, you caught me. That whole process. Um, honestly, I decided that I'm not supposed to. So I'm good. But thank you, Helene. That's perfect. Okay, well, then I have a question. Oh, I, I was kind of wondering about the whole concept of the resurrection and the, the idea that several people say that they have had an after life or after death experience, you know, where they've seen the light and felt as if they were dead or been pronounced dead and then suddenly come back. Any similarity? Any, any analog, an analogy between the two or no? Well, yeah, you could say that is a form of resurrection. Yeah. That, and, and there's probably millions of cases like that throughout the world and, and through and through time. Um, people do have that experience. They, they, they leave their physical body and their astral body. They have a fourth dimensional experience. 
they leave the third dimension and and they go up to heaven and have a spiritual experience and then come back in uh, into their physical body and resuscitate. And yeah, that's that's that could be seen as a, a form of resurrection. Most people are greatly changed by that experience. Lots of people develop um, a psychic and extrasensory perceptions after having that experience. Lots of people find themselves abandoning their own lives and, and starting on a truly spiritual journey after those experiences. And in the modern age, those experiences are very well documented. I mean, there's all kinds of books and videos and case studies and, and everything about them. And before all of that happened, my grandmother, I, I guess it was back in the, I think it was in the, in the 50s. She, she, she slipped and ruptured her spleen. And they, took her to the hospital and she died. But she came back and she told me and others of her grandchildren about her experience. And she was this old Italian uh, lady. And so she talked like this in the broken English. And she said, I left in my body and I go up into the heaven and who do I see? Jesus. And I, I look at him, I says, Jesus, you can't take me now. I got too many children down there that need me. And so he sent me back. <laughs> That's practically a direct quote. <laughs> Uh, that was <laughs> that was hilarious, but I know it's true. <laughs> yeah, and this was, oh, and this oh was before um, you know near death experiences. There wasn't even a term for it, you know. Uh, right. Then. <laughs> I like the interpretation. I like the your your lingo because I had a grandma that had a French accent so she was always in broken English and she had the ability to heal mm. heal oh honestly I might have told you that story but yeah another time okay. because I had I have to be excused. <laughs> this was wonderful, John, everybody. I enjoyed my first coming back to ACIM. Thank you so much. Okay, Stephanie. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. All righty, everyone. Um, if, if there's nothing else, we'll end with a moment of silence. <laughs> 